Good evening and welcome to this Thursday night edition of Feedback. I'm Mark Despotakis. Uh, tonight we're talking uh, travel. Some students at Clarion University had the opportunity to travel to South Africa this summer. We're going to talk about their experiences coming up tonight. Feedback starts now. As I said, welcome to this Thursday night edition of Feedback. I'm Mark Despotakis. We are talking uh, world travel tonight, and, and joining us on the program tonight are uh, Carla Flanoffer and Mandy Riz, both students uh, at Clare University. And uh, you, you ladies got to go to South Africa this summer. We're going to talk in detail about that. But first, uh, you got to go through the honors program. Um, why don't you explain uh, the program? What is it? Uh, the Honors Program is basically a program on campus for students that are freshmen through seniors. And you start out with a designated course called Modes of Discourse with Ralph Larry and Anand Rayo. And it's a speech and writing class, and that's the first class you have to take. And then they have different classes throughout your years here at Clarion that you take with the same Honors class. And you move from one class to the other. And you basically just have to apply and meet certain requirements and you can get into the Honors Program. So it's, is it is is like a separate curriculum or it's like a enhancement to your curriculum? It has like at the end of our senior year we do a senior thesis or a senior project, and it's actually it's an individualized instruction course, and you go over this with an advisor. It's kind of a project you start thinking about your freshman year, and it's supposed to be kind of like a synopsis of everything you've learned throughout your entire career relating to your major somehow. So. It, yeah, it's basically an enhancement, you know, to your okay. whatever classes you have. And they try to offer courses that are somewhat different, somewhat elevated, you know, just to make your college career more, ex more of a better, better experience. Hmm. So from this, you get to go to South Africa. How does, how does this, I mean, obviously, you're the only two from the university who got to go. Right. So how does this come out that you two are the ones who get to go? Well, how this works is this program is, every state school has an honors program. And this program has been going on for about 15 years now. This is like maybe the 16th year the program has gone on. It's a summer honors study program. What you do, you get every a state school university hosts it every year, a different one every year. And you, we've got six credits for it. You take two classes for a week, kind of like pre-session times two. And then, mm. you know, the traveling part is the wrap it up part of you, you incorporate what you've learned during these two courses and you study abroad. So the way that we got chosen was you could apply, like every summer, you know, where it goes, they pick two students from each school, and they, you know, based on your academics, based on your leadership on campus, based on, and this year was kind of special because we went to Africa, and they were kind of looking for people who had some abroad experience, and Carl and I had both kind of been abroad before, so they were looking for someone, because usually this trip is in Western Europe, and this is the first time it was taken out of there. We kind of went to someplace different, so. That's what they told us and how they picked us. We don't know. Well, so, uh, so <laughs> what, 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 what experience do you guys have then of, of going abroad before this? I mean, is it through the honors program or just life in general? Just life in general. Um, we've both traveled a lot. I've been to Mexico. I've been all throughout the United States. So I've had experience with, you know, heavy travel and what to do and how I should react in different situations. But, you know, nothing was quite mm -hmm. like going to South Africa. Well, I want to talk about that specific, but that's a very interesting point that you bring up. Uh, are you trained in uh, how to prepare yourself for going to this specific country? I mean, is there a specific training? For, like, did you guys have to go specifically? This is this is what the culture of South Africa is, or were you just kind of thrown into that? Well, um, there were students on the trip who had never been, you know, out of state. Not even out of state, but they've not traveled abroad, so you know it wasn't anything like it's like going to Europe for the first time. You know, people think of Africa, it's the bush, and everyone mm -hmm. runs around in loincloths, and that's not true. <laughs> 
And, uh, you know, we had an orientation. They explained to us what happened. And one of the different things, like, um, they're south of the equator, so it was their winter when we went down in June. And, uh, you know, just basic things. We went over what to pack. We had our little orientation seminar we had at Westchester University before we went for the program. This was in March. Um, you know, what to pack, what to expect. Um, and we also, in our courses, we took an oral history course and um, a leadership course in all aspects of society. And there was another course that students could take on social issues and health care. And Carla and I both chose to take the oral history one, which is how to conduct interviews with people, record them, you know, mm -hmm. and how to document them properly. And also we had read a book on the history of South Africa before we got there. So, you know, we studied all about apartheid and, you know, everything that happened. So, yeah, it wasn't like we were just thrown into it. Mm -hmm. we, were all, we were all preparing for what we were going to see. Okay. Take us through the trip. You know, give us the, maybe give us the Reader's Digest right now version and we'll talk details, but uh, where'd you leave from? And then when you got there, what was maybe initial, what, initial reaction to it? What was, you, what was your first thought when, when you landed? All right, just to give a brief overview real quick of what we did. Uh, we left from the Philadelphia airport and we flew into Cape Town, South Africa. We had a layover in Atlanta. Right. Yeah, and we had a layover in Atlanta, and then we flew to South Africa, and it took, on the way down, including the layover, probably about 17 hours to get Maybe there. Mm -hmm. So, no. <laughs> so when we got you get there, a meal out of it at least, I presume. Yeah, oh, you know, kind we of. We're actually dehydrated. We were expecting more fluids. I think <laughs> we were very glad to be off that plane. I'll tell you that much. We so, so it was 747. Yeah, it was enormous. So we get off and, you know, they take us to our hotel and we got to stay there for probably 10 minutes and then uh, they had us climbing mountains afterwards. And <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> so um, we, we directly went into, you know, viewing the city. We, ha we got a brief overview of the city and then, you know, we met the Dion Kitching who was the director over there that really helped to tie everything together and, you know, he was wonderful and he really set up some meetings for us and allowed us to go places that we would have never gotten to go as tourists. Hmm. So uh, we spent a lot of time in schools down there and we spent time with community members and you know not just seeing the side of South Africa that's industrious like Cape Town. I mean it's a very modern city and I think a lot of people have this mis conception that you know South Africa isn't that developed and it is. But then on the other hand we got to see the poverty areas and the people that are struggling and people that are struggling with AIDS and you know different issues that are really plaguing their society. So um, that was Cape Town part and then we went to Zimbabwe in the Victoria Falls area and we got to do a little bit of relaxation there and then we ended up in Botswana for a day and we spent some time there just kind of getting a feel for the area. Uh, yeah, I mean, tell me about the safari. I mean, is, like, how are you just walking through the wildlands? Or, I mean, Chobe is one of the biggest game reserves in Africa. I think it's like the second biggest. And uh, we got up at like 5 o'clock in the morning and we had got on these huge, like, jeeps. And they take you through the thing. And our driver was absolutely nuts. Like, he drove like 100 miles an hour. We'd see a herd of elephants and we'd block, he'd drive, so we'd block them off. We got charged by elephants like twice. Oh my goodness. It was awesome. And, like, we saw lions. Like, we saw this lion pull this, like, game buck thing out of the water. and hold it off somewhere. I mean, it was just amazing. Like that was that was wow. Amazing. But when we were in Cape Town, that's when we got to be kind of like the city. Like we stayed overnight on Raman Island, which is where Nelson Mandela was um, imprisoned for all those years. And we had a night tour, and it was just our group. And the man mm. who g gave the tour, it was really a humbling experience. We saw Nelson Mandela's cell. And uh, when we went visited the different schools, they tried to take us. Our first school was a really, really nice school. I mean, it was just phenomenal. Like these people were playing. Uh, harm or what's it called memory, memory. on recorders and like a four part harmony like, we couldn't play Mary had a little lit. so <laughs> and you know these kids they said to us you know, like, what do they think of Americans do they think we run around and we live in the jungle I was like actually a lot of them do but uh, that was just that was a great experience and then we went to a school with less money and saw their conditions and then we went to a really poor school and one thing that uh, our group actually did was in South Africa, a lot of things are subsidized by the government, so a lot of really poor children had uniforms supplied by the schools, and um, but they didn't buy shoes. So there's some kids there who had no shoes, and so what we did is a gift to Dio, who was like the contact in South Africa for all of us, to do all these things. We established the Dio and Kitchen Shoe Fund, and mm. we all pulled our money, I think it was something like $800 or something like that, just to get him started off. Well, he we went to a union in Westchester about two weeks ago for our trip, 
and he sent us a video email telling us how um, they've raised over fifteen thousand dollars for this fund. All wow! Right. So that was just so great that you know we could say we were a part of something. And that's like that. just in three months. And it's really wow. incredible. And that was started with your right. group. And one of the people who went with us was a reverend around the Westchester area. And it was a really big church, a Methodist church. And it started with him. And then they went to a church in South Carolina, I think it was. And it just spread. So that's like wow. Thing. And we got to cook lunch for about 3,000 school children one day. We helped prepare it, take it to all the kids, and give them soup. Wow. They were just telling us how, you know, this one little cup of soup and this piece of bread, it was probably their only meal that day. So that was just, it was really touching for us. And one thing, my favorite part, and I think Carlos too about the trip with the kids, because they were just so excited to meet Americans. You know, we haven't met Americans mm -hmm. before. I mean, and everyone, they, we were just welcomed with such warmness by everyone we met. And I think we really left a good impression on the children or everyone we met, because um, someone that we still talk to is our, we had a little tour guide at their school. Her name was Bianca, she's about in the eighth grade. And, uh, you know, I was wondering, how does she feel when the September 11th happened? You know, just having met right. Americans. You know, I'm thinking that really had to affect them. And she emailed me back and she said, oh, you know, I'm so worried about you guys and some other kid from the school did too. He's like, hi, I was just wondering if you're okay. I don't know where you are, but I know you're by New York. I was just making sure oh, everything was wow. right. And so we talked to this one little girl every day. And mm -hmm. It's That's just amazing. amazing. Like, we have the context and the bonds that we've made. It was just, it was an amazing trip. We got to do so many things. I, I can talk to you about this first. I want to talk more specific about something that we, we have to take a break. Of course, time is always our enemy here. Uh, we are going to take a break. We are going to talk a little bit more about the trip. I want to talk first impressions when we get back. When you got there, what, what did you think? Stay with us. We'll be back on feedback right after this. This portion of the programming was made possible through a grant by Fox's Pizza Den. Fox's Pizza Den is located on Old Route 66 in Clarion and offers all-day delivery. Phone 226-5555. That's 226-5555. Fox's Pizza Den is open seven days a week for your convenience. Phone 226-5555. for some TV5 news anchors provided by Fashion Bug, located in the Clarion Mall. Whether you're looking for junior trendy, girls, or fat women, have it up your miles. Fashion Bug also offers wide selection of accessories. Fashion Bug is located in the Clarion Mall, just off of Exit 9 of Interstate 80. Open Monday through Saturday, 10 a.m. till 9 p.m., and Sunday from noon till 5. This portion of the program is made possible through a grant from Clarion Hospital. Clarion Hospital is located off of Exit 9 of Interstate 80. Clarion Hospital offers outpatient services, transitional care, as well as an emergency room open around the clock every day of the year. More than 400 employees and 80 physicians work to serve the community. Call the Clarion Hospital at 226-9500. Clarion Hospital, providing health care to Clarion County and surrounding communities since 1954. Do you want complete coverage of local, state, national, and international news as it happens? Then tune in to Clarion's very own TV5 News Live for complete coverage of the Clarion area and our world. TV5 News crews join with crews from the world's news leader, CNN, to provide complete coverage of the day's events. With advanced satellite capabilities, TV5 News can bring you the latest news as it happens. So tune in every Tuesday and Wednesday night for Clarion's very own TV5 News Live. Welcome back to Feedback. Uh, we're talking here today with uh, Carla Flanhofer and Mandy Rizzo, you guys in the Honors Program at uh, Clarion University, and uh, got the chance to go to South Africa, and we've been talking a lot about uh, your reactions to everything, and we were just talking about the kids and how that kind of really affected you. I want to talk about, I want to get what your first impressions were when you landed in, in uh, South Africa. What did you think right away? If, was there any point that you said, Am I really here? Why am I doing this? I mean, did you did you find yourself saying that anywhere? Maybe like even in the first day or, or first couple of hours? First impression. Definitely. Um, I think when we first landed, none of us really believed that we were actually in South Africa. I mean, we're getting off this plane after 17 hours and it's kind of, we're all disoriented. But Dion actually set up a band to welcome us. So when we walked, really? when we walked out of the airport, 
there's this welcoming band, they're playing us music, and the first sight that you see is Table Mountain. And it was covered in clouds, and it was, the sun was coming up, and it was just, it was literally breathtaking. I mean, there's really no words to describe it. And that, I mean, that was the first thing I remember. And getting on this bus and trying to get everything organized, and the band's playing, we're taking pictures, and... Everybody was just like, wow. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, the city, it was so different. It was very, it's very European. You know, driving on the left side of the road. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember, I got off the plane, and I'm thinking, oh, that was the worst time of my entire life. When I'm finally here, I get stopped in customs. I'm like, why me? I'm just <laughs> with everyone else. And, uh, yeah, we had the band there, and that was really neat. And we were taking pictures of everyone, and just driving through the town, and, um, yeah, as soon as you got the plane, you see this flat, huge table mountain. It's what, it's just awesome. And then we went there that day and like went up it and saw everything. And so that was kind of a tourist thing. But yeah, and every day, we like we didn't care that we had to get up at 6 a.m. We were just like, oh my gosh, we're doing this today. And it was just such a great experience. And that's thanks to like Kevin Dean, who had gotten a Kellogg grant. And he has been to South Africa before and established his connection so that mm. this program could do something less touristy. And so from the friends that he's made, that helped us to do all the things that we did. Um, cultural differences. What what do you see? What did you find in the way um, of how people, first of all, reacted to you as Americans, uh, and then w w stepping into their culture for that period of time? What did you really notice? Things that that, that maybe you said, "Whoa, you know, this is very different from America." And did it make you kind of rethink? How you live your life back in America? That's like three questions in one. But <laughs> um, I think the most, you know, prominent thought that I've had like the whole trip was this really isn't that much different than us. Really? Um, you know, we saw some of these really impoverished areas, and we were in the cities. And their cities, you know, it's just like anything like we have, and we have poverty too. And as bad as theirs is. It, you know, we can relate to that to some extent. Mm -hmm. And there really isn't, I mean, it's not this huge cultural shock. It's not like being dropped off in the middle of the desert and seeing, you know, half naked people running around. And you really, it's just a civilized society, and there's parts that are sad, and there's parts that are really, like, devastating to see. But on the other hand, you know, it is a beautiful country, and they really have made a lot of improvements towards working towards where we are right now as far as culturally and through civilization. But I think, I don't know, I think one of, you know, my biggest impressions was how they did react to us. I mean, they, especially the kids were so welcoming to us. I mean, they would just run up, and it's the greatest thing in the world for them to see an American. They wanted to know everything about everything, and they wanted to know about soap operas. I mean, they... Uh, it, really? Bold and the Beautiful is huge. I had to explain <laughs> to and their teacher what was going on in Bold and the Beautiful because they just had to know. No, wait, they're aware of it? Oh, yeah. It's definitely... There's, um... When we were getting ready in the hotel room one morning, I saw a commercial for Big Brother South Africa. Oh, <laughs> really? Big Brother. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm so glad Carla said that because when I first went to Europe, I thought the same thing. I thought, oh, my gosh, this is so different. That's what's going to be great, but... What we learned, what I learned on that first trip was that we're all the same, we're all human, we all feel the same. And when she told me that, like that's what she told me, I'm like, that's what I learned the first time I went out. And it was exactly the same. Any cultural difference there were, we embraced, like the food. Like mm -hmm. we're thinking, we're going to oh. Africa, we're never going to eat. The food was phenomenal. I mean, we were eating like pumpkin soup and the stuff called, this fish called snook. I mean, we had just, so everything much that food. was different, we embraced. Even like the things that were hard for us, that made us glad that. We're, we're American, we've had the lives that we've had to live, you know, maybe we think we have it hard, we don't, you know, but it was more positive experiences than that, it was, and like even the adults that we talked to, Carl and I got to interview a student and an adult, we prepared for this ahead of time, and uh, one thing we did, we wanted to talk to everyone about apartheid, you know, how did you, what did your parents think about this, how did they live through it, you know, blah, 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 and when we, you know, got paired up with, you know, white Afrikaans, students who are our age, they're like, well, we really don't know. We didn't live through it. You know, we don't really care about that. It's in the past. Hmm. And that was kind of a shock for us, too. We were like, but we learned so much from them. I would imagine that would be like sitting, if someone from there came over and asked you about the civil rights movement right. in America. Yeah, we should have. And our teachers even told us, like, don't get cornered in. I mean, just like you said, you know, you're not planning your questions. We're just going to whirl it. We had a whole list, and he told us we couldn't follow it, and he was right. So that's definitely a learning experience. And you know, the adults we interviewed, I interviewed a man named um, Lambert Engelbrecht, and he invited us back. He's like, anytime you guys want to come down, call me up. We have all these rooms in our house. I mean, he's just so interested in, 
you know, America students to meeting because he's a college professor and he like, you know, so mm -hmm. everyone just welcomed us with open arms. That was going to be my next question about apartheid. What, you know, did you did you hear anything at all then from, from obviously maybe not in that specific interview, but anything there, did you hear how, how the society there is now coming out of that? Uh, you know, and even with when you toured uh, Nelson Mandela's cell, I mean, did, what what did you get uh, on that front? Uh, we had one day where it was kind of like a lecture series, and we had a bunch of guest speakers um, from the leader of the Black Sash, which is a women's a prominent women's movement uh, during the apartheid era, and it was you know white women that got together that were a little bit more wealthy and fought for the causes. Um, we also had you know a variety of other members of the Truth and Reconciliation Committee come and speak to us about what they were trying to do and how they were trying to heal their country. So we had that for probably about four or five hours oh, yeah. the one day. We had someone from William F. Clerk's office come in and he was, pres William F. Clerk was president when Mandela was released. He's the one who released him from prison. And, uh, you know, when we came home from South Africa, we're in our hotel room watching HBO and there's a special on apartheid. And Mary Burton, this woman we talked with, was on HBO. We were just like, I was me, you know. <laughs> I mean, that was that was amazing, and uh, we learned so much. Like the country is a healing. I had a, the, what the Truth and Reconciliation Commission is is when apartheid ended. Instead of having like the number of war trials and you know finding the people who did it and punishing them for all the crimes against humanity, what they did was they said, okay, if you're involved in this, you must come forward. You must tell everything that you know. And if we find out that you're lying, then you we won't be granted amnesty. If you're not telling the whole truth but you won't be granted amnesty. If the jury thinks you're lying, you won't be granted amnesty. But that's all you have to do is come forward, confess to the families what you did. And you think that it wouldn't, just saying you're sorry wouldn't be enough, but it kind of was, because what else can you do? Like, for their society to move on, like, I had a big problem with this, you know, I thought this is such an injustice. And I kind of had to step back and, you know, look at it. Is you know, I didn't live through this, you know, I don't know what's best. And it just seems to be working out. You know, this apartheid just ended in 1991, or 1994. Mm -hmm. when Nelson came into office and uh, you just really it was such an amazing thing to see like the healing that's going on in the country and there's still its problems like the white Afrikaner and English populations kind of see the government now as a reverse apartheid you know they feel like everything's being taken away from them um, a lot of the whiter people are saying how you know their children don't have a future in South Africa because of all the changes but they're healing you know mm -hmm. and it's just it was like I said it was just such an amazing thing in history that we actually got to witness firsthand. And we got the viewpoints. I think it's so important that we got the viewpoints not only of the people that were being repressed, but those that were repressing them. And how, you know, they really knew so little about the situation. Like the kid that I interviewed, he said, you know, next thing I knew someone was, you know, ransacking my house and stealing from us and destroying our property. And he's like, we didn't even know what was going on. We didn't know what the government was doing. We didn't know how oppressed these people were. And it's so hard to understand that they don't know what's going on in their own country. But they were so brainwashed that this whole concept was completely new to them. And it was, I mean, it was amazing because you can look at it from every single perspective. And we got such a diverse stream of information about, you know, what these, this group of people thought and what this group of people thought, and we can really step back and analyze, you know, this is what the situation is, and it's really incredible how well they're dealing with it and how we well they're adjusting. back in 50 years, because this is kind of like when segregation ended in the U.S., and I want to know how they feel, because I think the U.S. has come a long way. It's still not completely, you know, there's lots of racism in this country, especially right. after what's happened, but... It was just such an experience, like a moment in history, you mm -hmm. know, and we definitely want to go back and see, you know, how things are going to be. Uh, almost, you know, speaking, I guess, in, almost in terms of immediacy, it just happened months ago. What, what did you take away specifically into your lives now? Do you live your lives differently now after having gone than you did, say, in April before you went? Is there anything specific that you can pinpoint? Um, it's just mainly an attitude, and like I said, it's something I learned the first time I went to another country was respect for the human race and I always tease my mother and I call her ethnocentric because she won't try anything new mm -hmm. or have respect she talks about things she doesn't know and you know I was like well you don't know until you experience it and so having that experience definitely has made me a better well-rounded person and you know I do live my life differently because I have more respect for the world as it is and I think about the things that I've seen the people that I've met and you know it's just a part of me that I can never take out. Right.
It's all, like for me, it's just being open-minded and being able to take situations and look at them and analyze them and just try to understand what it's like to be someone else and be in that situation and to be, to accept everyone for who they are and accept them for their faults and to really, you know, build upon that and build upon the conditions that exist not only here but elsewhere in the world and I think what a lot of us brought back and we just had a meeting back at Westchester last week and what everyone was really saying is you know what's really amazing is the people down there didn't want our help with them they wanted us to take their stories back and improve our conditions at home and you know if we can to go back and you know just help them and to spread the word to people about you know what goes on in the world to keep people out of oblivion wow. there's such pride when we traveled in their country and everything that they did I mean it was just for me getting off the plane it was what beautiful physically beautiful country when I'm seeing mountains and in the ocean right next to it I've never seen anything mm -hmm. like it in my entire life and I said driving to getting off the airport and seeing a little shanty town right but there's just so much pride when we were there and you know when we ever he we hear the national anthem of South Africa we're just like oh uh. you know it's just such an amazing experience you know we're out of time but this was a lot of fun. We could certainly talk about this. I have a feeling we're going to talk a little bit after the show, too. Um, thank you guys for joining us. Good luck uh, in the future. Yeah. Stay with us. We'll be back right after the break, and I'll wrap things up. Every year, people who care about the world's children trick-or-treat for UNICEF. This is how we do it. Hi, I'm NBA basketball player, Vlade Divac. The money we collect buys medicine, clean water, nutrition, and education. It saves kids' lives. This October, wherever you go, wherever you are, take the box. Call 1-800-252-KIDS or visit www.unicefusa.org. chance at getting picked for a cool job with great pay if you take algebra, geometry, and calculus. You need to know how math can improve your future. Demand it. Call NACME. We'll tell you. Uh, welcome back to Feedback. Uh, that's it for the show tonight. Uh, join us next week, a very special program that we're actually taping this weekend. Uh, jazz vocalist from Pittsburgh, Lisa Hinmarsh, will be up here performing actually in our studio with the Clarion University Jazz Band. She has a, uh, a CD out of Listen to It. It's very good. If you remember last year about this time, we had done an interview with Ann Hampton Calloway, who was forming on Broadway at the time. Lisa's music is, is very similar to Ann's music, so uh, if you enjoyed that, you will certainly enjoy this. That's coming up next week on Feedback, next Tuesday, next Wednesday night on Feedback. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Stay tuned. Coming up next is TV5 News Live with Pat Grace and Susan Honorat. Have a good week. We'll see you back here next week. <laughs>